All right. Next up, we have financial crime, the past, present, and future. Please give a warm Torcon welcome to Marcelo Mansur. All right. Hi, um, my name is Marcelo, and I'm from London. If you haven't heard of me, don't feel bad. I have the exact same problem in London. Um, so yeah, um, as I said, my name is Marcelo, and I'm one of these. I'm not one of these or one of these or one of these. I used to be one of these. It was my job to sell these products to these people, but the whole thing turned out to be this when these people made us. <laughs> so um, I guess a brief look at the products we sold. Um, they were generally commodities, and um, I found out after we were raided that for the most part, the way that the scam worked was that they were um, far more, or, um, we, we basically, or our company had marked them up something like generally by about a thousand times at least from what they were actually valued at, or in some, in like the worst cases, they just didn't even exist. Um, now, um, one thing we didn't sell, and one thing that's really sort of, I guess, synonymous with boiler rooms are... Uh, pink sheet stocks, penny stocks, uh, micro cap stocks. Has anyone seen Wolf of Wall Street? Okay, I'll take that as a yeah from most of you. Um, cool, so yeah, um, that, that's, what, that's what they're doing in, in that, basically. Um, and these work kind of different from just a, a standard markup. These work in a way, as, it's called a, a pump and dump scheme. Um, this this uh, pump and dump scheme started getting you know or it was quite synonymous with with I guess the internet in in the early in the early days of it uh, because it was used by a guy called Jonathan Lebed who um, he got in trouble with the SEC he was the first person in general to to, um, to known to have done this but he had been going into online forums um, and you know creating hundreds of fake accounts and basically um, hyping up stocks that he owned like a, a fair amount of. So everyone who'd take his advice would jump in, push the entire price of the stock up, and then he'd get out and, you know, the, the, the share price was, like, it had been artificially inflated. So in the end, it ended up just, you know, losing everyone else a lot of money. Now, um, yeah, as you can see, he did pretty well. I mean, 12 grand, and in some cases, like 74 grand a day is pretty good, especially when you th think about the fact that Jonathan Lebed was 15 years old at the time. Um, and yeah, also, like, at, at the end of it, it was interesting because the SEC fined him something like 200 grand and said he couldn't, he couldn't um, trade for a number of years, but he still ended up walking away with at least half a million in basically illicit trades. Um, generally, though, that's just one guy in, in a forum hyping things up. Generally, when that's done by brokerages, they'll, they'll, have, like, they'll have a whole team, as you see in Wolf of Wall Street, you know, pl um, plugging these things. And um, the brokerage owns a big chunk of the stock. So if you want to know what happens to your money when you invest in a scheme like that, that that's what happens. Uh, um, you can kind of see from here, like um, on the um, in the far corner, as as they start to you know get on the phones and start um, sell selling the stock, it has a, a huge up, uh, or a huge increase. And then at the top is when they decide just to sell everything and. If, if, you, if, you're, if you weren't part of the brokerage and if you're just one of the people who got in and decided to hold on to see what would happen, you ended up out here with absolutely nothing. Um, okay, so moving on, and we'll get back to, to that sort of thing in a minute. Who was working in tech at the time of uh, the tech boom? Or the, yeah. Okay, a couple of you. Was it fun? <laughs> right, so um, what we have here, this is the NASDAQ. So this is uh, the index of the top 100 uh, tech stocks in the US at the time of, of the, um, well, going up to the tech boom and then, and then afterwards. And as you can see, obviously, just around 2000, it was starting to, to do very well. And then when the bubble burst, we are on the way back down. And um, when around sort of 2000, mid-2001, 2002, Investors wanted to, with, there was no clear end to like this bear market in sight. A, a bear market is a market that's going down. A bull market is a market that's going up. Just use those two animals. Don't make your own ones up. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so I've gotten a major problem in San Diego Zoo yesterday. Like, let's not even go there. Uh, but yeah, um, so yeah, around sort of 2002, like investors still wanted to be able to make money from the market despite, despite the, the poor conditions. So... Um, they started to look at other ways, other non-traditional ways of investing their money. And this is what led to the rise of the hedge fund. Um, that's, I guess, the inverse of, of that chart. And that shows around the same sort of time, sort of 2002, this is when people started to move their money out of the traditional kind of long-only funds and into hedge funds. 
Um, the reason being is hedge funds, um, and also hedge funds got um, quite, quite popular because, with banks because they would trade an awful lot. And every time a house like that makes a trade, the bank's getting some, or, their, or the broker is, ma is making some sort of commission from it. Um, if you take your traditional long-only funds like Fidelity, um, they'll go through committee and subcommittee before any kind of share price um, or share purchase is approved. Whereas hedge funds don't care; they'll trade like whirling dervishes. Um, you get sometimes you get enormous buy and sell orders. Sometimes like within the same hour. Um, so yeah, um, interesting thing about hedge funds as well is they can do something called shorting, uh, which is generally when you, as you guys know, if, when you buy to invest something, you um, well you buy and then if it gains value, you make your money, and if it does, if it loses value, then you lose your money. Shorting works in the exact opposite way. It's basically where you borrow shares and sort of, I guess, sell them and get them and get the difference back later on. But the, the long and the short of it is that um, you make money when you short shares if the price goes down as opposed to um, if it goes up. And hedge funds did this a lot. So even while the, the, the market was going down, hedge funds were still making an absolute killing off it because um, they were just shorting um, a load of tech stocks and, well, all kinds of things. Um, and the reason I bring up hedge funds in particular is because they're synonymous with insider trading. Um, I could just read that out, but I'm sure you guys can read. Um, if you don't know what insider trading is, it's, yeah, it, that, that's what it is. Um, a lot of people think that, a lot of people say insider trading, oh, it's really not a bad thing. Um, I prefer, I, the, the best analogy I have for describing it is imagine you're selling your car that you know only has about 20 miles left to someone else at face value or selling it to someone else as new. Now you're getting a great deal on what's effectively a useless piece of junk, whereas the guy who, who you're selling it to has no idea that what he's bought is completely worthless. Um, that's kind of what's going on when you're selling, um, if, if you have some insider information about a share that's about to drop, that's pretty much what's happening when you sell it on because the person that you're, who's buying it from you doesn't have access to, to that same information that you do. Um, so yeah, why is this all relevant? Who knows what they are? Anyone, does anyone trade financial markets themselves? Does anyone have like a foreign exchange account or something like that? Okay, one person. So um, these, uh, things that pretty much anyone here can just open an account with, put some money into, and start playing around with the market um, on their own. Now with these, um, you can, in the same way, um, so you can leverage, meaning that if you put in, let's say, $1,000, you can effectively trade with generally up to $10,000 um, of what's basically borrowed money. But the, if, as in, if your, if your trade goes well, and, and you make a correct prediction, then the more money you make, um, well, you basically make about 10 times as much money as you would um, if you were just trading with your own $1,000. The flip side is if your trade goes wrong, then you're losing it 10 times as fast. Now, not any of these, my lawyers have told me to say, but apparently um, there are some foreign exchange brokers or some um, spread betters that you can actually invest your money in just purely using Bitcoin. Um, therefore, not, you know, not requiring the standards, you know, bank account, et cetera, that, that can identify you. So where does this lead us? Does anyone know this guy? Because due to what I see on LinkedIn, that guy's responsible for all the hacking ever. Um, anyone know someone who can, like, vomit code like that? Um, who hears, are there any pen testers in here? Well, actually, are there any hackers in here? <laughs> None, you bunch of liars. Um, <laughs> like, who's ever, let's say, just, you know, on a job, who's ever hacked into someone's private email address before? I'm just going to assume no one's going to tell the truth here. <laughs> but yeah, so let's say, you know, a, a fair few of you, and um, those who haven't know that at least it's generally not a, a difficult thing to, uh, generally not a difficult thing to do. Who thinks that if you hacked into a CEO's private email, you'd, you'd be definitely be able to see share price sensitive information that you could probably act on and make a killing on, um, especially if you're going to use not one of those, but a company like one of those that you can um, you know, anonymize your account with. Um, has this happened yet? Yeah, a few times. And some people have been caught and some people haven't. The first and I guess most obvious case um, and the one that's made the most noise is, is this. Um, a big coalition between traders in, uh, well, yeah, traders in New York and hackers in Ukraine. 
um, who would basically collaborate and over, over the course of a few years ended up making something like 100 or just over 100 million dollars on illicit trades that were purely based off of the fact that they'd been able to gain um, information that isn't privy to, isn't available to the general public. Um, and it's interesting because the, the fines or the, the sentences given for this was fairly small when you take into account that very few people get convicted of insider trading, so the few that do, um, the SEC um, and, and the courts like to make a, a big um, example of them. Like uh, there was a guy called Raj Rajaratnam who ran a big hedge fund called Galleon Group. They had something like $9 billion under management. And when he was caught insider trading, like they had him on, on rec like, uh, like recorded conversations between him and the people who'd, who'd, who'd been sort of getting information for him. And they'd say things like, oh yeah, I just got off the phone with my guy. I played him like a fiddle. Um, when you have that kind of thing recorded, it's a bit difficult to deny it. But he ended up getting 23 years for what was basically just you know, trading off, off insider secrets. So it's interesting to see that we're seeing less, you know, less serious sentences for this kind of thing, especially when you take into account that th there's not just, they're not just listening to things, they're actually, they are breaking uh, computer crime laws as well. Um, another example, so these three guys, um, does anyone want to have a guess where they might be from? <laughs> Ash, it's unfair to be fair. I mean, one of them, one of them's from the Philippines. But yeah, they are. Um, they are. Um, they're, they're, they're no, they were known as the Chinese Three, um, which is a bit racist if you think about it. They just ignore the Philippines guy. But um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so they these guys. They it wasn't what they did wasn't even particularly sophisticated. So they they did make uh, successful insider trades on on a couple of acquisitions that, that happened, but they had something like over 100, well, yeah, they made something like 90-something attempts, and most of, which were most, most of which were thwarted, but then a few of them did go, um, well, according to plan, but then they ended up getting caught. Um, and as far as people who haven't got caught, has anyone heard of Fin4? Okay, so FireEye wrote a report about them um, a couple of years ago, and since then there hasn't been much, much else that's come out. Um, all we know about them is that they, they're most likely still at large, they definitely native English speakers, uh, they definitely understand Wall Street lingo and, and financial slang, if you like. And as opposed to doing what some of the, some of the previous crews have been doing, they're not um, dropping malware or anything like that. They're literally just um, spear phishing and reading confidential emails. And they're setting up sort of, um, in some cases, they set up um, conditions so that um, certain emails delete themselves. For example, like if sysadmins email someone saying, look, I think you've been hacked, it's like anything with the word hacked in just gets deleted um, and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a fairly basic concept and is why I think they, they were able to sort of operate for a while without... Um, uh, without uh, without getting caught or without you know coming up on, any, on anyone's radar, but yeah, so they're still at large. And um, interestingly, a method they use very much focuses on the nature of the financial industry. Um, so this is an email that was sent. Or this is one of the phishing emails that they had uh, that was sent to um, uh, that was sent to I guess one of their victims. And they're playing. As, if anyone's worked in the financial sector, you'll know there are a fair few egos going around in there. And it's basically an email that says, look, there's someone on this, on this financial forum who's talk, who works for you who's talking shit about you. Um, I don't think it's a very good thing for your company. Here's a link. Just have a look at that. And uh, yeah, and obviously the, the link's infected. So um, well, that's how that works. So yeah, we have these, I guess, three cases of, three definitely known cases of um, groups operating um, in, in the hacking versus uh, hacking and insider trading sense. Um, but is this, is this stuff open source? Is this, this, is this done like individually? Um, yeah. Fin4 are a mix between these people and these people. But there are an awful lot of forums and stuff on the, or two forums mainly on the dark net. Um, the biggest one being Kickass. Nothing to do with Kickass torrents. Um, I don't even know what that is. Don't ask me. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so Kickass is just, it's one of, it's a um, underground marketplace. They, involved in an awful lot of things, but one of them is uh, confidential information. Now, as part of research for this, I did consider attempting to get on board with them and create an account just to sort of have a snoop inside the forum and see what was going on, but it costs 250 bucks a month, and apparently once you pass selection, um, it costs 1,000 a month. So, I mean, sorry, Torcon, I don't love you that much. Um, but um, 
Also, um, apparently Kickass is set up by a, um, three traders, two analysts, and basically, a, effectively, an entire team of, I guess, the ideal people to to um, to, to run a scheme like this. Um, and there's another one online as well called uh, the Stock Insiders. Stock Insiders is a little bit more exclusive; like they don't uh, mess around with other things, but they do have, um, yeah, they do have supposedly a, a very elite kind of. Uh, close-knit group um, who, who uh, have good access to, to confidential uh, financial information. Um, so again, I had a look at this and see, see if I could get in, but then I think on this one to get in, you need to, um, you need to offer them a, a piece of information and then they'll verify it and if it works and they let you into the forum. Um, and one, I don't have information like that, and two, I'm not gonna break the law <laughs> just, to, just, to, just to, uh, for a talk, but yeah. Um, another concern that's bothered a fair few people is sometimes it's not necessarily difficult. You don't necessarily need to have an awful lot of people who have this kind of information. It's, not, it's quite easy to bribe, and it does happen quite a lot. People um, who are, I guess, lowly paid members of, of companies um, being bribed to click on links that, that are sent to them. So yeah, um, I guess today we've just looked at how financial crime used to work, how, in ways that it's sort of working now, and here we just have a, a brief glimpse of, of the future. Um, companies like Red Owl said that insider trading on the dark net doubled last year, and unless I'm completely insane, we, it's gonna triple, quadruple, et cetera, until some sort of fix is found to this. Um, I don't know what the fix is, but I am asking the questions, and I should probably tell you that that's the end of my talk, because otherwise you're gonna wonder where I've gone. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, feel free. No questions? So, um, yeah, I mean, funny story about that, actually. The guy who, um, so the, the boiler room that I worked for several years ago, I, might, I, long, I long later found out that the guy who actually interviewed me for that position, who I never saw again, was actually the kingpin of an operation of about 30 different boiler rooms um, that, that were operating in the UK. And I found out yesterday morning, he's just been arrested in Morocco for, um, Actually, it was, it was a co-working scam, but before that, he was on the run from the SEC for a Bitcoin scam. But it wasn't, it, that wasn't particularly sophisticated. It was just, he set up a platform and people put money in and it was just a Ponzi scheme. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't particularly sophisticated. But if you're asking, will we, are we likely to see a, mo a lot more of this in terms of cryptocurrency? Definitely. Um, yeah. It's interesting because there's enough money to be made in that sort of scene without having to completely, you know, rip people off. But yeah, yeah, exactly. And also with um, Bitcoin, it's interesting to see the way that worked and, and still is working because since it's, it's it was a completely, I guess, new concept in in the world of of investing. The way it behaved was completely unlike any other asset. Like we saw, I mean, what six years ago it was less than 0.1 cent, less, way less than 0.1 cent for a Bitcoin, and then it shot up to what four th four grand like a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago. Um, nothing's ever behaved like that, and especially not in the crazy kind of spike um, fashion we've seen with Bitcoin. And probably what will happen is Bitcoin over. This is purely speculation, so don't do anything based on this. But like, um, probably Bitcoin will, over the next few years, it will start to level out, and then one day, and not in not too long, it will start behaving like a normal currency does. Um, but I think we'll still see loads of stuff like Ethereum, Potcoin, Dogecoin, like all, all the other kind of crypt, major cryptocurrencies that are coming out, probably do the exact same thing. So like a huge rush, and then down, and then maybe like another one that goes even higher in a couple of years. But um, I don't think anything will pick up in the same way as, as Bitcoin did or to the same volume. Anyone else? 
This would have been a bit longer, but I only had 20 minutes. So that's why I was sort of rushing through a little bit. But yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, guys. It's been great.